Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am a member of Al now. My name's Aaron. Aaron. That was by far the most interesting introduction I've ever had. <laughs> thank you, Larry. I do want to thank the committee for inviting me here. It means a lot to be invited here. And I want to express my gratitude for that. And uh, and I, w- I want to thank Jim and Larry and Tim and everybody else for taking such good care of me. When I heard it was a three-hour drive from the airport up here, I got a little nervous about that because you never know who they're going to stick you with when you come to these things. And that, that could have turned out to be a real long drive. But uh, Tim picked me up and brought me here. That was the shortest three-hour drive I've ever had in my life. We just talked program the whole time, and it flew by, and I really enjoyed our time together, and I've enjoyed spending time with everybody here. And um, my home group is a one-purpose Al-Anon family group in Charlotte, North Carolina. We meet on Thursday nights. We discuss the step each Thursday, 8 o'clock. On the last Thursday of the month, we discuss the tradition. I absolutely love my home group. I hope you feel the same way about yours. If you're ever in the Charlotte area, I'm in the book. Please look me up. I'd love to take you to that or any other meeting. We've got a lot of good recovery, AA and Al-Anon, in Charlotte. And I'd love to take you to a meeting. Uh, Tim and I were talking, like I said, on the way here, and it turns out we share a lot of the same opinions about Al-Anon, and that's always fun, you know, sharing a soapbox with somebody. But, uh, you know, what I've been told is my job when I'm behind the podium is to try to set aside my opinions and share with you my experience, tell you in a general way what I was like, what happened and what I'm like today, and, and I do try to stick with, with my story. Um, you know, it's true that I qualify for this program. Uh, I, I am a friend or family member of alcoholics, and alcoholics helped me get here. But it's also true that it's not like I was going along in life thinking and acting like a normal person, whatever that might be, and then I met an alcoholic. That's not my story. I've seen that happen, but that was just not my story. The defect of character that made my life completely unmanageable and still can today, the self-centered fear and the overblown sense of responsibility for everything and everyone, and the resentment and the rage, I don't remember a time that I wasn't dealing with those things in my life. So I always try to make it real clear that I needed a meeting long before I picked up my first drunk. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here because there's something wrong with me, and that's what keeps me coming back today. And I hope to make that clear. But I do need to tell you a little bit about some of the people that helped me get into the program of recovery that I desperately needed long before I had any idea. I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was born into a very loving home. Uh, my mom is the most loving person I have ever met in my life. But there was also a lot of fear in that home, and it's not because there was no kind of abuse of any kind. And I never really know how to explain this, except that love and fear seem to go hand in hand. If you loved someone, then you were afraid for them all the time. You were afraid for their health and for their safety. And in fact, that's kind of how you knew how much you loved them, was how fearful you were for them. And uh, my mom, like I said, was the most loving person. She was also one of the most fearful people. I'd ever met, and I, from very early on, I didn't understand why she was the way she was. I was a miserable kid, um, and I'm not quite sure why. I just didn't fit in. I was painfully self-conscious from my earliest memories. I got into Al-Anon and, you know, learned what self-conscious, what those words mean. It means I'm thinking about me. I'm conscious of me. I'm thinking about me all the time. I'm thinking about what you were probably thinking about me, when, of course, you're almost never thinking about me, but I think you are all the time, and... Um, just, I was socially awkward. I didn't know how to talk to people, and I hated I hated authority, and I just fought with everybody, and I was a rough first kid for them to have. I was the first of five kids, but, uh, you know, one of our family jokes was that mom needed to save the world. Like I said, there were five of us, but we didn't seem to be coming fast enough, so I had a series of foster brothers in and out of the home that uh, they were living with me for a while, and then would go away, and and mom, you know, there to love them, and, and that was a good thing. I think all of those kids came out of homes with alcoholism, and they needed someone to give them the unconditional love that my mom was, was willing to give them. But, you know, I, I just, I didn't understand that, and I didn't understand why there was always some stranger staying in the house that mom was taking care of, and every holiday there was a, a homeless person or someone at the table that mom was taking care of. And these are good things. These are not bad things. But being selfish and self-centered from, from a very early age, what I saw was that all these strangers are getting my mom's unconditional love, and for some reason I felt like I had to perform 
uh, and be good enough. And I have no idea where that idea came from. They never told me that, and they never hinted at that. So for some reason, that's what I, I thought early on. I just didn't understand why Mom had this need to save everybody in the world. Um, I just thought that's how she wanted to be. But the thing was, the only drinker I knew growing up uh, was my mom's mom. And see, I, when I came into Al-Anon, I would have told you that I was absolutely not affected by alcoholism when I was growing up because my parents aren't alcoholics. I don't know if I'm, my mom's mom, my grandmother is an alcoholic. She's a daily drinker today and has been as long as I've known. But one of the things al has given me back is the relationship with my mom. I understand a little bit of why my mom was the way she was growing up. Um, having grown up as the oldest child of a problem drinker, at the very least, she learned a lot of uh, strange behaviors and, and attitudes that she passed down to me. And, and I've gotten to learn about the family disease of alcoholism. And that when, when there's one alcoholic in the family, a lot of people can be affected by that. Whether they have a lot of direct contact or not, at least that's my, been my experience. But early on, I didn't see a problem. She was the fun grandma. You know, she was not the one that wanted to take me to church and make me sit quietly. She was the one that would give me the first sip of every beer I'd, I'd bring her from the fridge and, uh, you know, uh, act inappropriately in public. And that's a lot of fun when you're a little kid. Um, as I got older, I started to see uh, how that has affected, her drinking had affected the rest of the family. But, you know, I had no idea. I, and she was always crazy. You know, she didn't change when she opened that first beer. Everybody else in the room changed when she opened that first beer. But I, I, I never understood that. And like I said, I would have told you that I was absolutely unaffected by her drinking growing up. And I know today that, you know, through my mom, I, I, I came up with some really crazy ideas about what it means to love someone what it means to be a good person for my mom. But I want to make clear that I'm not blaming my parents for, for who I am. I stopped doing that a long time ago, and I love my mom today. We have a wonderful relationship. I've got a great relationship with my dad, and it's all due to Alan. I'm very grateful for that. But like I said, I was a miserable kid. I, uh, I grew up in a very strict, kind of fundamentalist-type type home, and I went to a, a, a small uh, religious school, and I got some strange ideas about God there that I'll talk about a little bit later. But... Uh, I fought with everyone, and uh, I, I, I couldn't stand authority, like I said. I ended up getting uh, to kicked out of that school halfway through eighth grade, um, or asked to leave. My parents said, you weren't kicked out, you were asked to leave. There's a difference to them <laughs> for some reason. But um, And there wasn't one big incident that caused that. They just finally got fed up with me just arguing about everything, and it was just being a jerk all the time. And, uh, and I've been able to go back and make amends to some of those teachers and that principal. Because I was. I was just a miserable kid to have to deal with. I wouldn't have wanted to have to deal with me. But I got kicked out halfway through eighth grade, and then I was homeschooled for a year and a half, which was just miserable for everyone involved there. And uh, then for the last three years, 10, 11, 12, I went off to um, to a small, another small religious uh, high school uh, where I was absolutely miserable. I, I Like I said, I, I really can't express how uncomfortable I was in my own skin. I, uh, I had that gift of perfectionism by trying to perform for approval, and so I did very well in school. Uh, the only thing that kept me from getting kicked out of that high school was the straight A's. Uh, I had uh, skipped a grade, actually, uh, through, through making really good grades and working hard, so I was a year younger than everyone, which made my social difficulties even worse. So I was 14 when I went into 10th grade there. And all those people, they, they all had money that we didn't have. My grandmother had scrimped and uh, uh, saved to, to send me there. And uh, they all seemed like they all had money, and they all looked exactly the same, and they all dressed in the, the nice clothes. And and I, I, I did, and I just I, I, I couldn't I couldn't relate to anyone. And I was absolutely miserable. What happened for me when I was 15 years old is I found my very first solution. And uh, she was really easy to pick out of that crowd. You know, she she came in and she looked different than everybody else there. Uh, she had her hair I think it was dyed pink and shaved in a V in the back. Um, she wore crazy clothes all the time, and I know today I could have picked her out blindfolded because I'm good at finding these people. But um, she she was my solution. You know, I, I don't know if she was looking for someone to save her, but I know today that I was looking for someone to save. Uh, Mom had taught me that to be a good person, you go out and you find sick people that you think need your help, and you hold them down and help the hell out of them whether they want it or not. And that's how you know that you're a good person, and that fit the bill for me. I had a gaping hole inside me that nothing had filled, but finding someone that I decided needed my help, that that did it for me. That that uh, I had arrived. I had a job. I had a responsibility, and I never had to think about me and what's wrong with me. 
And she was she was nuts. I've never I had never met anybody like her in my sheltered existence. She was drunk all the time. She uh, was never where she said she was going to be. She lied about everything. You know, like they say, when the truth would have served her better, she just lied. And I'd never met anybody like that. It was exhilarating. It was um, terrifying. Um, I was 15. She was an older woman. She was 17. That was exciting. And uh, and we just were off and running. And uh, like I said, I always had something to think about because I was constantly making excuses for her, bailing her out of situations she'd get herself into, um, and feeling needed. I remember... I distinctly remember the, that that satisfying feeling of holding her hair while she threw up because she needed me. Here's this sick person who needed someone to love her. She had been passed around from one family member, like her mom and then her dad and then some uncles and aunts. And I think she was living with some cousins by this time. Nobody knew what to do with her, and uh, she needed me. She needed my help, and darn it, I was going to just help her whether she wanted it or not. And... Um, we were off and running. Uh, we graduated the same year. She was 19. I was 17. And uh, so we've been together about a year and a half, a year and three quarters of this time. And she went off to school, to college in Tennessee. And I say, I, I, you know, I, I had scholarship offers. I did very well in school, but I was terrified of school. I was terrified of people. I said, I hate everybody. I hate school, and I'm never going to college. And so I moved out at 17. She went off to Tennessee. And uh, and I said, I'm moving out, and I did. At 17, uh, you know, for the first time, I... Uh, I had an opportunity to choose who I was going to live with. And who I chose were three other guys, all between 16 and maybe 18 was the oldest. And uh, two of these guys were well on their way towards probable alcoholism with some other outside issues. And then uh, the fourth guy was one of these normal people. He wasn't one of them, and he wasn't one of me. And uh, I think he lasted a month, maybe. And that, uh, <laughs> He did what any normal person would have done in that situation. He moved back in with his mom. He said, I can't do this. I have to get up and go to work in the morning. And someone rented us a house, which is really remarkable to me. And it was a, a nice place for about a week, you know. And uh, like I said, that guy moved out, and I, I was so angry at him. How can you, you know, abandon me with these irresponsible idiots? You know, and uh, what happened was I very quickly fell into a pattern of living uh that I would take for, for many years of my life, which was living in this haze of self-righteous indignation of why. Why is it always me that it has to make sure the bills get paid and the holes in the walls get patched and the cops get talked to when they're here every week? And why is it always me? Why can't they get their act together? Why? I, never once looking at the, the fact that I chose to live there. I don't know how to describe that. It never occurred to me that I was making a choice to live there, that I had other options, that I could move out. I could, well, I could have moved back home, but that really wasn't an option at that point. But that I had any choice about being there was always about if they would just get their act together and pay the rent and take care of themselves. And, you know, that, that's just how I began living my life. And um, like I said, this girlfriend and I were trying a long-distance relationship, and we were talking by phone, and she was off at college doing her crazy thing. And, uh what happened was, uh, I guess I was still 17 at this point, when the normal guy moved out, uh, we, we, we had to get somebody in there to pay the rent. And um, we found this guy, and he was really old. He was probably about 30. And um, he always had lots of money. I have no idea how we met this guy, but he was throwing money around, and we thought, well, this guy will probably pay the rent. So he needed a place to live. He was blowing through town and needed a place to, to live for a while, so we invited him to move in reason he had a lot of money is that he was not only probably an alcoholic with some other outside issues, he was selling that stuff that he was hooked on. That's why he had all the money all the time. And he did pay the rent. I'll give him that. Uh, but things got really unmanageable after he moved in there because now there's a lot of more people that I don't know there 24 hours a day. And I am literally kicking people off the bathroom floor every morning when I get up to go take a shower. And I am just angry all the time, miserable, and I hate everybody. And I, again, no conscious thought of, of my choice to live there. This is just how it is, and uh, the self-pity run rampant. And uh, so, what happened was uh, one of the original guys that I moved in with. Uh, we hung out a lot. We got to know each other. He was, he, I would have considered him a really good friend. We got to be real close and. And we drank a lot together. You know, I, I try to remember to, to mention that I was right there with these guys doing most of what they were doing. You know, if alcohol had done for me what it did for the alcoholics that I've met over the years, I'd probably be dead. I needed something to fix me, and it just didn't do it. I, you know, I don't have a disease of alcoholism. If I had 
continued drinking like that, maybe I would have crossed the line, developed a physical allergy. I don't know. That's neither here nor there. My point is, there's no room for any kind of self-righteous attitude for me coming into Al-Anon about, well, if the, if the alcoholic just hadn't drunk, they wouldn't be like that. You know, they're before the grace of God. I was right there with them. I just didn't develop a disease, and I'm grateful for that today. But we hung out a lot. We drank a lot together. And what happened, he got hooked on that stuff. The guy was selling. And um, I, I mentioned this because this is really the first time that I remember that I really tried consciously to, to control someone's intake of anything. With the girlfriend, I knew there was no controlling her. I never once even tried to keep her from being drunk all the time. There was no point in that. It was just my job to clean up the mess afterwards. But with this guy, it was such a drastic personality change. It seemed like overnight he was a completely different person. I'd never seen anything like this, and it devastated me. And um, I remember I must have read about Puff Love somewhere, and I sat him down one day, and I had a real serious conversation. And, and I said, I love you, man, but if you keep doing this stuff, you know, we, we just can't be friends anymore. And he looked at me and said, okay, see ya. You know, <laughs> He didn't say, well, your friendship means a lot to me. I need to think about it. He just said, all right. And I was devastated. How can he do this to me, you know? And, of course, it had absolutely nothing to do with me. But back then, you know, everything had to do with me. I'm so grateful in Al-Anon today to know that almost nothing has anything at all to do with me. But I took everything so personally back then. How can he, back then, how can he choose to do this stuff over our friendship? I thought that, you know, I meant something to this guy. And I was, I was, was really upset about that, and I hope he's okay today. I've lost track with him, and uh, he's a good guy. But um, anyway, um, I remember that girlfriend was coming to visit. I have no idea what time I got started, but Al promised me he would let me know when my time was up. So I'm going to guess I got started about 10, 15 minutes ago. Um, that girlfriend was coming to visit me, and um, I, I remember I, I was so excited. I was very proud of my little crack house that I was living in. I was uh, um I was 17, and I had my own house, and I was real proud of that fact. And uh, she was coming to visit, and I was just tidying it up and getting ready for her. And it's the first time I've seen her in, I guess, a couple, couple of months. And uh, I, yeah, I just remember she walked in the door, and this is just a testament to the type of place I chose to live. She walked in that door, and someone just handed her a substance, and she did what she always did, which was to ingest that substance without looking to see what it was. And uh, she's off to the races. Now, my plan for the evening is we're going to sit down and catch up and see how school's going for her and how my job's working out for what her plan for the evening now involves, you know, sitting in the corner for the next eight or ten hours looking at her hands. That's what she's going to be doing tonight. And, again, I was devastated. How could she do that to me? You know, I had plans for the evening. I've been looking forward to this so much. How could she do this to me? And, of course, you know, that's what she needed to do. And it was, she always did that. Why was I so surprised every single time the same thing happened? You know, what was wrong with me? But uh, I don't know. That, like I said, that wasn't the first of the hundredth time something exactly like that happened. But that was it for me. I don't know why that was the last straw. But I couldn't take that anymore. And so I, I had to break up with her. I gotta be completely honest though, and this is embarrassing to say, but I was scared of her. She, she, her behavior was very erratic. She was not particularly stable. And so like a real man, I waited till she was back in Tennessee and called her, broke up with her over the phone. And I'm not proud of that, but I gotta be honest about it. And she did what I expected. She, uh, freaked out and, uh, she had her roommates calling and telling me she's gonna hurt herself. You gotta, you gotta change your mind. You gotta do something. I had no idea how I was able to say no. I think that was God doing for me long before I believed that God would do anything for me. I I never said no to anyone for anything. I, I just because that's not a good person just doesn't say no. I remember I, I remember this recently. I there were some strangers. I didn't know them and I didn't know their friend, but their friend was in jail and they had the bail money. But because none of them had a driver's license or whatever you have to do to get a a, a bond, they just needed some. These are strangers who are probably sleeping in my house, but. I went down there and signed a, a bond. They had the money, but I signed the bond for this stranger because that's what a good person would do. Now, fortunately, he showed up <laughs> for court, but never saw these people again. I wasn't even doing it for their approval. I just thought that's what good people That's what idiots do. <laughs> that's not what good people do, but that's the sort of thing. So I never said no to anybody about anything. But for some reason, I was able to say no to her, and I just I said, I can't do this. And she tried to reach me over the last, uh, the next, few years, I moved around a lot in my late teens and early 20s, and I was never in the phone book, but she would call my parents 3 o'clock in the morning, and they wouldn't give her my number, but they'd tell me she's calling again. 
and I never talked to her again. And uh, I mentioned her for a few reasons. One of those is, uh, I don't know, about six years ago, I found out that several years after we broke up, she did end up killing herself. And uh, I'm so grateful, selfishly, that I had some recovery when I found that out, because if I had not, I would have done what I always did, which was to make it all about me. What could I have done? in my infinite wisdom and power, I guess, to, to prevent that. Maybe if I had taken a call. Maybe if I had, you know. And when I found that out, I knew that I was powerless. There was nothing that I could have done. I was powerless over her disease just as much as she was. And uh, and I didn't hate it. When I came into Al-Anon, I hated that woman. I thought that she had ruined my view of women and of love and of relationships because of all the damage that she's done. I, and uh, when I found that out, I just felt sorry for her. She was not a bad person. She had a horrible, horrible disease. Uh, and uh, and I just felt sorry for her and her family that she never found recovery. But going back to now, I was still 17, maybe turned 18. When I ended that relationship, I found out that I can't be alone. I, I can't because now all I have to do is, all I have to think about is me. And I cannot sit and think about what is wrong with me. And so I, I, I had to find somebody else to do it. So it was not long after this that I, uh, you know, found my next volunteer hostage. There she was. She needs help. She's sick. And uh, she was uh, she was living in a, a situation with her parents where her older sister's alcoholism had just destroyed that family. And, um, you know, she needed my help, and that's my one criteria for a relationship. And so we moved in together. She was still in high school. I think I was 18 by this time. She was 17. She hadn't graduated yet, but she had to get out of that house. And so we got a place together. And uh, spent the next four and a half years together. Four and a half of what I, I really hope are the worst years of my life. <laughs> and and I, I really hope for her that the worst years of her life, too, because we did a lot of You know, we I don't know if she's an alcoholic. We both did a lot of drinking in that relationship. We both did an enormous amount of damage to each other. And, um, you know, we had we had some good times. We uh, I got a VW van, and we traveled all over the country, all over through Texas and everywhere else. And, over half the state, and I lived on the road for months at a time, and uh, I was <laughs> I was trying real hard to be a hippie. Um, I had the long hair and the beard down to here and the VW van, but what I found out, at least in my experience, is that people who need Al-Anon desperately make really bad hippies. Um, at least I, I was the worst hippie in the history of hippies. I feel you know, really um, uptight and uh, schedule-oriented and... Uh, <laughs> Full, full of self centered fear and anxiety all the time about everything. I just, I never got, I had the look going on, but I I never got any other part of it. It was so attractive to me, that seeming ease and comfort of just not caring about anything, but I just, I could not do it. Um, you know, it's my van. Um, but uh, I know they were all wondering what was wrong with me, but. Uh, Anyway, so we had some good times, but it was mostly absolutely miserable, and everybody knew how miserable we were except us, you know, and uh, we were going to get married. Uh, you know, we were talking about getting married. I, I, you know, I, but I, I stayed for the same reasons that I stayed in jobs that I hated and horrible friendships and other relationships. This idea that uh, this is as good as you get. It's never going to get any better than this. Um, she needs me, and I desperately need to be needed. And um, more than anything, just the, the worst relationship was better than the, the horrifying prospect of being alone. I just couldn't. I just couldn't handle that. Nothing could be worse than just being by myself and only having me to think about. And so, like I said, we were shopping for rings. We had found a place in Boulder, Colorado. When we were on the road, we were going to go off and get married. Um, what happened was, I met the woman who is my my wife today. Annie and I were working together. Uh, at my dad's natural food store. I was a manager there. It's not the only job you can get when you look like I look. Is manager of your dad's natural food store. Um, <laughs> which was that job that I absolutely hated every day of my life. But uh, anyway, we were working together there, and I had never met anybody like Annie. She was just so beautiful inside and out. She had, a, a I don't know, an emotional maturity to her that was very different from anybody I'd ever met. And more than anything, she had a spirituality to her that was completely different from any idea of God that I'd been raised with or had ever met. Uh, and uh, what I fell in love with, in large part, I believe, was the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Annie had been sober about four years at this time, maybe three years at this time. And we just fell head over heels in love with each other. And neither of us ever thought that kind of love uh, would, would have been possible for us. Uh, and 
you know, but the awkward thing is, is I'm going to get married. And so, and we're going to Colorado, like, next week. Um, and the, one of the other awkward things is there's a guy living with us who lives in Colorado who I've told I'm going to drive back there when we go get married. And so, uh, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And so, I, I had to end that relationship. The hardest thing I've ever had to do, I really, and this is embarrassing, I really didn't think she could live without me. It's embarrassing to say those words out loud that I truly thought, and she's fine. She's told me many times <laughs> that she is doing just great, um, and she's real grateful that I ended that miserable relationship. But anyway, um, ended that relationship, but here's this guy that I told him I'm going to drive to Colorado. So one morning I got up bright and early, and the three of us piled in our car, uh, took everything that we owned, and I drove. I wouldn't let anybody else drive in full-blown, insane control mode. Got to do this. Got to get this done. From Charlotte to Boulder, it took almost exactly 24 hours. Um, I don't know why they didn't just hit me in the head with something and take over the wheel. That was that was nuts. But I got him there, dropped off the guy, dropped her off with some friends to take care of her, and uh, and uh, I, I don't know how long I was there with all hay. Gave her everything that we owned that we had accrued over four and a half years because that's how I deal with guilt. You take everything. Um, gave her the car. Uh, Got on a Greyhound bus, about a 44-hour Greyhound bus ride back, from the, which is a lot of fun if you haven't done that. And um, and I got back to Charlotte with everything I owned in a duffel bag over my shoulder and my pillow, and I uh, was 22 years old. And uh, Annie, my wife today, picked me up about 3.30 in the morning, and, uh, and well, we moved in together because that's what I do, apparently. Um, moved in together before we had our first date. Um <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend, but, you know, we celebrated 11 years of marriage, so thank God for the programs uh, that we're both in. But anyway, um, and we just were off and running. Like I said, we were just head over heels in love. I never imagined that somebody this incredible and beautiful and wonderful and spiritual could love someone as miserable as me, and I hated everything about myself. And this relationship immediately became my higher power. She became my higher power, and she didn't ask for that. I put her up on a pedestal that she was bound to fall off of. But, uh, but it was great for a while. You know, it was absolutely wonderful, and I started meeting her AA friends and going to some open AA meetings, and I loved that. I mean, I love drunks. I've been hanging out with them my whole life, and if you're sober, that's even better, and uh, just a lot of fun to be with, you know, and I, I read the first 164 pages of her book, and I thought, oh, that's great, you know, for people that need it, and uh, and I heard her give her talk in AA, and I thought, man, she really needs it, <laughs> uh, and so, I, you know, I thought, oh, that's great, AA, I uh I read that night. I had so much guilt and remorse and was just filled with shame. And I read that, that ninth step was really good. And uh, so this, this is a horrible idea. But I thought, I'm going to go work a ninth step with that girl that I broke up with. And, uh, you know, no steps one through eight or sponsorship or powerlessness or anything. Just going in there with lots of expectations. We called her up. We sat down in the restaurant. And I don't usually share this. I don't know why I saw it in my mind. I just sat down with her and just told her what a, just a horrible person I had been. And she agreed. And, and then she added a bunch of stuff I had forgotten about. And I didn't feel any better. And I thought, well, I guess those steps don't work for people like me. And uh, put that book away. But, uh, you know, it seems to be working for Annie. And she's happy, joyous, and free. And uh, so different from the person she talked about in her talk. So we were just going along. And uh, what happened was we went to visit uh, some friends of mine up in Wilmington, North Carolina, near the beach. And it was actually that normal guy that had moved out. We were still friends. Uh, years later, he and his girlfriend were living there. And we went out to eat one night. And this restaurant was also a brewery. And Annie told me she's got a few years of, uh, of sobriety. She's comfortable being around alcohol. And I'm not going to tell her story here. She'll explain to you why what happened next happened. But we're sitting around, and they bring little shot glasses of beer uh, so you can see what kind of beer you want to order. And I'm not alcoholic. My friends aren't alcoholic. So there's these little shot glasses, and Annie just reached over. And, you know, so I don't even think she finished the shot. She just took a sip of that, that beer. And, again, she's given me permission to tell you this, but she had gotten to a point in her recovery where the relationship had become her higher power, too. And she had stopped doing the things that she needed to do to maintain her sobriety. And what she was hoping for is that we would say, all right, it's about time that she took a drink. Come on, join us. And then she'd switch over to something else because she never liked beer, but that's not what happened. We all knew she was sober in AA, and said, what are you doing? You know, stop that right now. 
And, uh, yeah, I didn't know much about AA, but I kind of got that the idea is none. You know, don't, <laughs> don't drink at all. That's about all I understood. And um, so, and that was it. The most alcohol I've ever seen my wife consume. She put that down and played it off, said, oh, there's no alcohol in the sip, no big deal. I didn't think twice about it. What happened, again, she's giving me permission to share this. We got back to Stroud. She had a new sponsor. She was going through the steps again and doing a fifth step. And on the way out the door, kind of as an afterthought, she said, oh, a few months ago, a couple months ago, whenever it was, I took a sip of beer. And her sponsor said, oh, well, you know, you're going to need to change your sobriety date. Well, uh, the woman that came home from that meeting with her sponsor was not the woman that I fell in love with. (laughs) The woman that I fell in love with loved Alcoholics Anonymous and loved her sponsor and was full of gratitude for the fellowship and for the program. The woman that came home that day was angry and resentful and just mad about it, and uh, and everything changed. And she wasn't drinking, but she was a completely different person, and I had never experienced anything like this. Now, I was used to dealing with active alcoholism where I could blame it on the drinking. I could blame the behavior on that they were just drunk, they're going to sober up, things are going to... I don't have any experience with this. And I didn't know what a dry drunk was. I just I, I, I just knew that she was nuts. Seemingly overnight, this was a different person. Her behavior, her attitude, everything had changed. And, and, I, and I'm thinking, this is my fault, of course, because it's all about me anyway. But if I hadn't been there, if we hadn't been there with my friend, she wouldn't have taken this drink. And meanwhile, she's going crazy. She's saying things like, if I'm going to pick up a white chip, I'm going to go earn a white chip. And I'm terrified. I'm absolutely going out of my mind. How am I going to stop that from happening? How am I going to keep tabs on her at all times to make sure she doesn't really go pick up a drink? And I know that I want to spend the rest of my life with this woman, but not really this woman. You know, this this is a different person. And how am I going to live the rest of my life walking on eggshells until I screw up again and she really does get drunk and it's all my fault? And I'm just, I am absolutely upset. I've gone from, you know, the highest uh, I've ever been in my life down to further down than, than I had been before. And I am, I'm just nuts. It's the first thing I think about every morning when I get up, the last thing I think about before I go to sleep. I've lived with active alcoholism before. I know I can't do that again. Um, I'm just crazy. I mean, I reached the point where I, I really couldn't imagine life with the alcoholic, and I couldn't imagine life without the alcoholic. And I was nuts. And I was talking to a friend of hers in AA, about all these crazy thoughts, and, uh, and her friend just said, you know about Al-Anon, right? And I think I probably said something like, yeah, I know about Al-Anon. Uh, my view of Al-Anon came from uh, some uninformed members of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> that's, <right. laughs> that's where I got my opinion of Al-Anon, and I have never been more sure of anything before or since that I did not need to be an Al-Anon. Um, but you know what? I was desperate. I just, I, I couldn't go on thinking and feeling every day the way that I was. I, I, you know, I think that a lot of us have to have that gift of, gift of desperation. I know I did to just try anything. I mean, I was positive that Al-Anon was not for me, but I thought, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to give this a try because things are crazy at home. I knew, I know I'm insane. And, uh, and so I went to my first town on me. This was in June or July. It was a haze, and nobody told me to write the date down, so I didn't. But it was June or July of 1999. I was 23 years old. I still had a beard down to here and the long hair. And I walked into the Queen City Monday Night al Family Group in Charlotte. And I looked around that room, and uh, it was about, it appeared to be about 95% female. Uh, the median age appeared to be about 102. Um, <laughs> And I think I may have offended some people saying that from behind the podium in Charlotte. I want to make sure, make it clear that was just my perception. I was 23. I was immature. Everybody looked really old. Everybody looked really female. And um, and I looked around and said, there's no way I can have anything in common with anybody in this room. And uh, you know what? I, I just knew they were judging me for the way I looked. And of course they weren't. They told me they were, uh, they were glad I was there and I was in the right place and they loved me welcomed me with open arms. Nobody ever asked me if I was maybe in the wrong room. And I'm very grateful for that because I was looking for a reason not to come back. I did not want to be here. (laughs) I was begging you to give me a reason not to come back and nobody ever would. And I'm very grateful for that today. And and I started listening. I was terrified of people. Just full of self-centered fear all the time. I I couldn't. If you handed me something to read, I literally couldn't read it. My hands shook so bad. Um, But I started listening and finding out that I'm not the only person dealing with this. 
I'm not the only man that feels this way about the woman that he loves, and I really thought I was uh, the only man on earth that felt that way. And, uh, and so I kept coming back, and this went on for a while, and I, and I, you know, I was starting to feel a little better, but I kind of hit a plateau. I hadn't gotten a sponsor, and I was coming to meetings, I was going to a lot of meetings, and it was helping, but uh, in the meantime, Andy and I did end up getting married in uh, uh, January of 2000, and the first few years of our marriage, uh, we had some really good times, and we had some absolutely horrible times. Even though she wasn't drinking, like I said, we went through just about everything I've heard people describe dealing with, with active alcoholism in a marriage. And I, at, at first, I, you know, like I said, I didn't understand that. I needed to understand about the disease of alcoholism, that, that the drinking is just one symptom. And if there's alcoholism in a home, that doesn't necessarily need to be alcohol for there to be a lot of pain and a lot of hurt, and I, I needed to understand about the disease and what it was that I was dealing with at home so I could stop taking everything so personally and start making some healthy decisions for myself, because for a while there, she was nuts. I mean, she was, and she'll tell you that. She was dry, but you know what? I was just as nuts, and I heard that there was only one side of that equation I could do anything about, and that was me, and I better find a way that I can be okay no matter what she does, and that was absolutely impossible when I got down on There was no way I was going to be okay unless she got her act together and our relationship healed, and then I would be okay. That was my only hope when I got her. Um, but anyway, I, like I said, I kind of hit that plateau, and I wasn't feeling any better, and I just kept hearing people talk about the program. And I also want to mention, you know, one of my fears about coming into Al-Anon was that, you know, because of what I thought Al-Anon was, I really thought that the woman next to me was going to say something like, you know, and then he got drunk, and then he ran over the dog, and then he crashed the car into the house, and then the house burnt down, and I passed. And I was going to say, hi, I'm Aaron, and my wife took a sip of beer. And I'm really freaking out about it. And um, and they were going to say, get out. You don't qualify. I mean, I, just, I, I, I really thought she's not drinking. I don't, you know, my parents were an alcoholic. I'm really glad I landed in a group of, of Al-Anon where they weren't talking that much about the alcoholics. They were talking about themselves and their defects of character and how they had found a new way of life, how they could be happy, joyous, and free, like our introduction says, whether or not the alcoholics are still drinking or not. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. But I, I, what I kept hearing about was the, the step. The, the, the fellowship of Al-Anon is wonderful, and I love the fellowship. I love the meetings. But the steps are the program, to me, are the program of recovery. And that if I wanted to take steps, I was going to have to get a sponsor. And I did not want to ask another man to help me. And my fear and arrogance, um, I help. I don't ask for help. You know, I've done that way my whole life. But uh, I was desperate enough to ask for help, and uh, Tom was you know, in a Tuesday meeting at the club in Charlotte every time I was there, and uh, he had, you know, what I wanted. He had a peace and serenity to him that I wanted. He was always sharing the solution, and one day, in fear and trepidation, I walked up to Tom, and I just said, Tom, would you, you know, would you be my sponsor? And he said a couple of things that I'm glad he said, because I say him today. He said, are you willing to do everything that I do to get what I've gotten from this program? And, of course, I had no idea what he was talking about, so I said, yes. And he said, are you willing to pass this on exactly the way that's given to you? And, again, I don't know what he's talking about. I said, yes, Tom, I want, I'm willing to do whatever you do. I want what you got. Will you please take me through these steps and be my sponsor? And he said, I'd be happy to work with you, but i got to tell you, I'm also a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that. Uh, he, you know, a lot of our meetings will say uh, we ask members of other anonymous fellowships to maintain their anonymity so that we can keep the, the focus on Alan. And he did. I had no idea this guy was in AA, and I'm grateful for that today. Um, but at the time, what I thought was there were like 40 people in that meeting, and I could still pick the drunk out of the room. You know, I, I'm obviously still pretty sick. Um, but at this point, it would have been really awkward to say, well, never mind, Tom. So I said, I don't I said, hey, whatever, Tom. And he said, well, I can, spon- I can only sponsor you the way that I was sponsored. And if you want to do this deal, I'll, I'll take you through it. And that's what he did. He said, let's get started. And uh, I'm grateful for strong sponsorship. He told me what to do and when to do it and uh, and how to do it. And I just did what he did. And I thought I'd taken the first step. I knew intellectually that if Annie chose to drink again, that there was nothing I could do to stop her. I mean, she was out of control. Anyway, I knew up here that uh, there was nothing I could do about that. So I thought I'd taken the first step. But he wanted me to take a little bit deeper look at that. And he said, uh, this isn't in any of our literature, but it was a helpful tool for me. He had me make a list, as, uh, as I've heard others share in Al-Anon, of everything that I was powerless over. And then he had me write down exactly how my life becomes unmanageable when I try to control these things. And that was important to me for a few reasons. First of all, I needed to see that I'm powerless over everything that's not me, my attitude, my behavior, my reactions and actions. I also needed to see that my life is not unmanageable because I'm powerless over alcohol and alcoholism. And I think that's what I thought. My life is only unmanageable when I try to control the thing. 
that I'm powerless over. And I needed to see that connection between the things I'm powerless over and the unmanageability. I've lived my whole life with this delusion that if I love you, obviously I can't be okay unless you're okay. And of course, okay means that you're doing everything that I think you ought to be doing and not doing the things I don't think you ought to be doing. And, uh, and I know I'm not God, but I clearly see the path God has laid out for you. And you're not on it. And it's my job as someone who loves you to, to get you back on that path very lovingly because that's what love is. And uh, make sure you stay on that path and then you're going to be okay and then we're going to be okay. And if, if you're not applying my solution to your problem, the only reason I can imagine for that is that I haven't explained it well enough yet. I really can't think of any other reason because I love you and obviously I have your best uh, you know, uh, interest at heart. And so I must not have explained it well enough yet, so I will explain over and over and over and over in slightly different words uh, what it is I'm trying to, to, for you to get. And with this delusion that one day, fantasy, fantasy is the only word for it, that one day the scales will fall from your eyes and the light will shine down from above and you'll say, I get it. I understand what you've been saying all along. Um, and you'll apologize for not getting it earlier. That's always part of the fantasy. I'm so sorry. I didn't, it's so obvious. How could I not see that that behavior isn't okay? And then you'll change, and then I'll be okay. You know, and to me, that, that, that sums up the unmanageability of my life, the absolute insanity. That's how I live my whole life. And so, that, you know, I needed to see that. I needed to see the, the, the true depth of the unmanageability and the insanity that I lived with. And, that, you know, I haven't seen that, that I'm, I'm, I'm nuts. My only hope to be restored to sanity is that there's some higher power that can do it for me because I, I can't do it. If I, if I could do it, I wouldn't be here. I never would have come and down and on. And, uh, you know, I had a rocky relationship uh, with, with God. I had no real understanding. I know my parents taught me about a God of love. I just I didn't hear that. For a long time, I would say that they didn't teach me about a God of love. But I know today that it was my perception. I just didn't hear that. What I heard was a God of shame and fear. And my relationship with God defines the rest of my life. And so my life was about shame and fear. And so I came in, I really didn't believe, I knew there was something, but I didn't believe that God would do anything for me. And of course it was pointed out to me, I just had to come to believe there was something that could. I knew I needed to be restored to sanity. I knew I couldn't do it. My only hope is that something can. And if I can, if I can get the willingness to believe that, then my only next step is to make a decision to turn it over. I've, I've seen in the first step what a great job I've done with my life. My only logical decision is to make a decision, a commitment, to turn my will and my life over to the care of a loving God. And I was able to do that with some, with some real strong sponsorship. That was difficult for me, but I was able to make that decision. And that third step is something I've got to come back to every time I'm full of fear and anxiety. You know, it, it's always about me not getting my will. And I've just got to remember that I've got to turn that person, that situation, whatever it is, over to the care of a loving God and know that, you know what? Everything's going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to. It may not be the way I want it to, but it's going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to, and I'm going to be okay. We we got through those steps, and he had me start on the, my uh, my uh, uh, inventory. And uh, my inventory had uh, several parts, but a big part was that resentment list. And uh, I had a I had an easy time coming up with the people that I resented. I could have named 20 people off the top of my head that I hated. They ruined my life. If they hadn't done this, I wouldn't have been like this. And uh, and so I actually enjoyed that part of it. I get to list everybody who's ruined my life and what they did to me and how it affected me and fear, fear, fear. And, but, of course, then I had to turn the page, and it says, well, a couple things. Not only I need to think about forgiving them. Maybe they were sick, too, and doing the best that they could, just like I was. I didn't want to forgive them. I thought for me to forgive you, you had to come beg my forgiveness. And then maybe I would magnanimously bestow my forgiveness upon you. <laughs> but, again, that, you know, that, that's probably not going to happen. It hadn't happened yet. But it also says setting aside everything that's been done to me, I need to look at my part in it. And this is difficult. This is where I get to see my defect of character right there in black and white. The causes and conditions behind why I participated in every one of those sick relationships. And I get to see my part in it. And I get to find out that some of the things that I de thought defined me as a good man are actually these big gaping defects of character that are, that are blocking me from the sunlight of the spirit. You know that overblown sense of responsibility for everything and everyone? I thought that's what made me a good person. It's not. You know, that is not an asset. That is a, a defect character. That self-loathing that I clung to, I really thought that was humility. I thought that's what humble people thought. They just hated that, that they were no good at anything and would never amount to anything. I really thought that was humility. And that's obviously not humility. So I got to see there in black and white what truly my defect character were, but 
the good part about that is that means that I can do something about it. You know, that it's not the first, uh, the people and what they did to me that make my life unmanageable and make me so miserable. It's me. And if it's me, then with the help of a sponsor and this program, the uh, loving God that I have a relationship with today, I can do something about that. And uh, immediately after taking that uh, fifth step with my sponsor, he sent me home and I, I, I took six, six and seven. You know, right after that, I, I spent some time in prayer and meditation and, uh, Look back over those first five steps, and I really believed that I had done as thorough a job as possible. And uh, and I got down on my knees, and I, I asked God to remove those defects that I would identified. And I went to bed, and I really didn't have any kind of experience there, but I slept soundly. And got up the next day, and of course, all my defects were still there. And I don't know what I expected to happen, but I think I called my sponsor today. Hey, I've still got all this stuff. And he probably said something like, did you actually read the step, the words in the step at all? says we humbly ask God to remove them. You know, it doesn't say anything about them going away. And, uh, you know, my experience, just my experience has been they're not going to go away on, on, on my timetable like anything else. It's going to be on God's time. And it may not be the defect that's killing me at the moment. It goes away. But that, that readiness to have God remove the defects that he talks about in six, that's not, that's an action for me that I take every day. You know, I, I, show, I show my readiness by doing the actions, especially when I don't want to do. Um, God has never removed um, resentment for me if I keep doing something that I know is going to make me resentful. I can pray and pray and pray for that resentment to go away. It's just my experience. It's never gone away if I keep doing something I know is, I'm going to be resentful about. God doesn't remove my guilt if I keep doing things that I ought to feel guilty for. God's never removed my self-centered fear if I refuse to do things that scare me, like get up behind a podium. Um, that's a real good example for me. When I was first asked to speak anywhere, a little small al meeting, I was just in physical pain. Every time I thought about it, I was so terrified. And then when I was asked to speak for the first time, it's something more this size. I mean, and they give you a lot of time to think about that. Um, every day, multiple times a day, I w- it would come to my mind, and I would just uh, hurt. I mean, physical pain. Was, uh, I just I couldn't stand. It. I would say, God, I know this is self-centered fear. I'm just worried about what they're going to think, and if I'm going to say the right things. And I know that this defect is preventing you, for preventing me from doing your will, which I believe is to share what this program has done for me. And so, God, please remove this defect of character so that I can do your will. And I can tell you that when I got up behind that podium, I was just as terrified as I had been when they asked me to do it. But when I got down, it was a little better. And when I did it the next time, it was a little better. And that's just how it's worked for me. I want it to work in the other direction. I want God to remove the defect, and then, of course, I'll do God's will. But what I found in my experience, again, is just i got to do it despite how I feel. I've got to take the action, despite how I feel, and in doing that footwork, the God of my understanding is able to sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, usually slowly, remove those defects of character that are keeping me from being of maximum service to God and to my fellows. Uh, resentment is the same way for me. I'll say, God, I know it's your will for me to treat this person with love and respect, but I can't because I hate them for, you know, for what they're doing or how they, how they are, what they're not doing, whatever. So, God, you just go ahead and remove that defect, that resentment, and then, of course, I'll treat them with love and respect. And, you know, God of understanding says that's not how it works. You go treat that person with love and respect despite how you feel, and in doing that, that defect is slowly removed from me. And, I, yeah, like I said, I want it to work the other way. It just never has for me. i got to have the willingness to do it. Um, so I found out that everybody I resented on that list out of the men's there, every single person, and I got to add a whole lot of people there. And uh, like I said, I had so much guilt and shame, and I still had some resentment. I had worked a thorough fourth and fifth, but I still had some people I wasn't real thrilled about running into on the street. And um, I did not want to go make amends to these people, but with uh, my sponsor's help, I made that list, and I became willing. He, he, he really felt like I needed to become willing to make amends to them all before we moved on. That's just my experience. Um, and uh, that took some time, but I, I did. I wanted what he had, and I wanted to continue growing, so I became one to make amends to all of them. And uh, and I did. I went out, and uh, I found these people, and uh, and I made those amends. And I, you know, and he explained to me what that what that means. It's not just me going and apologizing. That's part of it, in my experience. But um, I need to make it better. You know, I need to I need to fix it. If I broke something, I need to make it better than it was uh, when I broke it. And uh, and I need to fix that behavior. I need to change. And uh, what happened for me was I was relieved of that guilt, and I was hoping that would happen. But what really amazed me that I wasn't expecting is that resentment was gone. And any lingering resentments that I still had were removed from me, and I didn't know how that worked. I thought you had, to, like I said, I thought you had to apologize for, to me for the resentment to be gone. 
And I didn't understand that for a couple of years until I heard a speaker and he explained it perfectly for me. I'm the type of person that would rather feel anything but guilt. I can't stand feeling guilty. So if I've done something to you that I ought to feel guilty for, I need that resentment there handy to remind me why it was okay what I did to you. You started it. You did this. If you hadn't done this, I would never have done that to you. I need that resentment there within arm's length so I don't have to feel that guilt. When I take care of the guilt, when I clean up the wreckage of my past and my side of the street, that resentment has no more purpose in my life, and I'm able to go anywhere and do anything today. And uh, what, a, what a freedom. I've, I've been able to go back to events at that church that I did not want to drive past that church when I, when I came in here. I, just, I was so full of resentment and shame. I've been able to go and participate in family events at that church and to be a family member and to, to, to contribute. I can go anywhere today, and uh, it's just an incredible freedom. I'm so grateful for that. And I never have to carry around that guilt and resentment today if I'm continuing to, to take personal inventory and, and try to promptly admit it when I'm wrong. And I do that today. You know, that's part of my daily deal is that I've got to try to keep that side of my street clean uh, so I don't have to build up that, that guilt and resentment that go hand in hand. But another part of that inventory today for me is i got to look at the full shelves as well as the empty. On a daily basis, I need to acknowledge just one little thing maybe of how I've dealt with that situation better or I handled that. Uh, in a more sane way than I used to. I need to look at what the program and the God of my understanding are continuing to do for me on a daily basis. And one of the reasons for that is on a really bad day, and this hasn't happened in a while, but on a really bad day, I can still get into thinking that this isn't working, that I'm just as crazy as I was when I got here. The program is not working for me. This whole God thing is nonsense. And the most selfish thing I can think, I have nothing to offer anyone because it's not working. And if I am daily taking an inventory of the full shelves as well as the empty and looking at what God is doing in my life today, it's almost impossible for me to get back. And that is a lonely place to be. And I've been there, you know, in recovery, and I don't want to be there today. And that's a big part of that for me. I didn't know how to pray when I got here. You know, the extent of my prayer was bargaining with that God, you know, my misunderstanding of what am I going to have to do, what sacrifice am I going to have to make to get my will done uh, in my life, or usually in your life, what am I going to have to do, God, to get this done? And I didn't know how to pray. And, of course, it was pointed out to me that all I have to do is pray only for knowledge of God's will in my life and the power to carry that out. I can complicate almost anything, but I love the beautiful simplicity of that. I don't have to figure out what to pray for today. If I'm praying for knowledge of God's will, and I'm trying to do the footwork in the direction that I feel led, then whatever happens is happening for a reason. There are no failures for me today. You know, failure is just another word for me saying I didn't get my will. Things didn't work out the way that I thought they were going to. You know, if I'm seeking God's will and doing that footwork in the direction that I feel led every day, whatever happens is happening for a reason. Even if it's the worst outcome I can imagine, and I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be given the tools and the program uh, to, to deal with whatever comes up today. And, and that, that idea that I'm going to be okay no matter what, it doesn't sound like much, but that is the exact opposite of who I was when I got here. I mean, that really sums up the spiritual awakening that I've had and I'm continuing to have as the result of taking these steps of Al-Anon. And if I want to continue, you know, to experience that, I'm asked to do a couple of simple things, which is to try to carry the message and to practice these principles. Practicing the principles is easy in a meeting. You know, you know, I am a spiritual giant for a few hours a, a week. and uh, But if I want to continue having the spiritual awakening, I've got to try to take that, you know, uh, in traffic on the way home from the meeting and into my home and into my work, and I don't, I'm, I'm still not real good at that all the time, but it's something I'm striving for, is to practice these principles in all my affairs, and trying to carry the message. You know, I, I try to do what I'm asked to do in Al-Anon, um, whether I want to do it or not, and, uh, you know, that's simple stuff usually. You know, I, I'm privileged today to sponsor guys and to spend the time with them that someone cared enough about me to spend time with me and to pass it on the way it was given to me and to just to have the wonderful gift of seeing the light coming on come on in their eyes when they realize that they're not alone, that there is hope for them no matter what they're dealing with. I'm an active member of my home group today. You know, I, and it's little stuff. I'll set up chairs, I'll make coffee, I'll do what you know, I, I just I want to be a part of this today. I want to be in Al Anon today and trying to carry the message inside and outside the program when I'm asked to do so. And uh, I don't do these things because I'm a great guy. I just do these things because I'm so grateful for what this program has done for me. And I want to continue to have this spiritual awakening. My life today, I I just can't. I, I can never put into words what my life is like today. Um, it's just beyond my imagination. I mean, it's life. There's good days and there's bad days. Annie um, works a wonderful, 
not that it's any of my business, but I think works a wonderful AA program. Today I admire and respect her program so much. Uh, she just picked up, I think, 12 years. Uh, she did end up picking up that white chip and changing her sobriety date, and so she's got about 12 years now. And uh, I love and respect her program. Uh, but we try to keep our programs separate, you know, and, um, but our programs come first. That's the type of marriage I have today, and I'm so grateful for that, that it's got to be God and our programs and then our marriage. And, and that's just our experience. We've tried it in other orders, and it just hasn't worked for us. And that means that if, if it's date night and the phone rings and somebody needs help, that's where we're going to be. And I'm very grateful to be in a relationship with a wonderful woman who's working that program. And we're not always on the same path, but we're trying to go in the same direction. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I was able to go back to school after years and years of saying I'll never go back to school. And, and you know, what does that have to do with Alan? on Everything. There is no way without the program of Alan on that I would have been able to face all that gut-wrenching fear uh, and go back to school and get a little two-year degree, get my first grown-up job uh, a few years ago. And, um, you know, every good thing that's happened to me uh, has been a result of Al-Anon and the relationship with the God of my understanding that I found in Al-Anon. And all the negative stuff is just my will, me fighting for my will. And that's, uh, I just can't tell you how grateful I am today. I can never sum up that spiritual awakening except that I know I'm going to be okay today. No matter what, I'm going to be okay. And there's the reading. This is, uh, this, this sums up the spiritual awakening that I've had and continue to have much better than I ever could. There's a reading, uh, in this book from Survival to Recovery. It's an Al-Anon book. Now, some people call these the promises. Some people call them the gifts. I do not wish to engage in any controversy, so I call on page 269. <laughs> out of from Survival to Recovery, an Al-Anon conference-approved literature. Um, and I know that there's no such thing as the promises. I, I do know that. But to me, anything in our literature that says, if you do this, this will happen, is a promise to me. And so to me, these are some of the promises of Al-Anon. And you might notice that like some other promises you might be familiar with, this starts with a big if. If we willingly surrender ourselves to the spiritual discipline of the 12 steps, our lives will be transformed. We will become mature, responsible individuals with a great capacity for joy, fulfillment, and wonder. Though we may never be perfect, continued spiritual progress will reveal to us our enormous potential. We will discover that we are both worthy of love and loving. We will love others without losing ourselves and will learn to accept love in return. Our sight, once clouded and confused, will clear, and we will be able to perceive reality and recognize truth. Courage and fellowship will replace fear. We will be able to risk failure to develop new hidden talents. Our lives, no matter how battered and degraded, will yield help to share with others. We will begin to feel and will come to know the vastness of our emotions, but we will not be slaves to them. Our secrets will no longer bind us in shame. As we gain the ability to forgive ourselves, our families, and the world, our choices will expand. With dignity, we will stand for ourselves, but not against our fellows. Serenity and peace will have meaning for us as we allow our lives and the lives of those we love to flow day by day with God's ease, balance, and grace. No longer terrified, we will discover we are free to delight in life's paradox, mystery, and awe. We will laugh more. Fear will be replaced by faith. And gratitude will come naturally as we realize that our higher power is doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. I remember the first time I heard that read in the meeting, I thought, there's no way. There's no way any of that can happen for me. Uh, I wasn't real sure it was happening for any of you. But um, the fact that sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, every one of these promises has come true in my life is an incredible miracle for which I would be forever grateful. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.